Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about uh, transforming critical care conflicts through curiosity, a process I call helping without harming. So the real issue here is we've got a battle of the amygdala versus the prefrontal cortex under stress in difficult conversations. So what we really need to know is dysfunctional reactions are overdetermined. There's almost nothing you can do about it. So why does this happen? basic principles of social psychology, like the fundamental attribution error, intent impact mismatch, system one, we just diverge into unawareness, speed, automaticity, overconfidence. So the good news, there's a way out, the neuropsychology of curiosity and positive regard. So what we're gonna be working on is how do you move from automatic to deliberate processing um, under threat? So why should you care? There's a payoff for clinical management, interprofessional collaboration, and patient care. Um, so I uh, wrote this all up in 2002, but I, I've uh, included a really helpful diagram for you to understand this better, because a reinforcing loop really can propel us to be overconfident and fixate on what we think about other people. So what happens is there's cues available about other people. We, we tend to ignore most of them, and we just focus on the ones that reinforce our existing view of the other person, you know, really plausibility from new cues. And so this all leads into kind of a um, stock, a simple uh, system dynamic stop of the plausibility of the leading diagnosis that we Jenny, currently have Jenny, uh, of our... Sorry, of Jenny. Our, what? Um, what the... We, we, like, what's with this complex diagrams, this physiology, you know, we, we talked oh, about this. Where's the clear, simple messages? I, I'm doing exactly what you asked. I just summarized the entire talk in 90 seconds. No, no. I know you think this academic stuff works at Boston, but, you know, these are real doctors and nurses. You know... Well, But you didn't even let me finish. Look, it's a, it's a reinforcing loop. Once we no, decide... No, look, look. I know, as I said, I know you think this works, but these people didn't fly all this way just to hear something they could read about in your articles. Thank you very much for participating. It's now time for the debrief. Okay, thank you all very much. You kindly were involved in this simulation without your consent. <laughs> uh, without a pre-brief, and um, I think I get a complete D on uh, uh, securing your psychological safety. Um, we also won't have time for a reactions phase. Um, uh, okay, so this simulation is over, but what I'd like to do is use this simulation to learn something about how do we manage conflict when we really care about the outcomes. So this was a simulation about a talk, but it could equally, uh, sorry, a conflict about a talk, but it could equally be about should we extubate the patient now or should we extubate the patient later? Should we intubate the patient before we go to radiology or should we wait? And the reason this is such an important issue is at the very moment when we need to be a little bit skeptical and doubting about what it is we're thinking, we tend not to be. So I'd like to talk about what was happening with me and Vic in this simulation. So let's go back and look at the uh, um, visuals here. Uh, Vic was giving me some very spicy feedback about my talk. I was defending myself because I wasn't ready for it. She had a very good point. I might have had a good point, but she never asked. And we were unable to come to a solution together about how to actually make this talk better. So why this matters is, unless we can instantaneously and immediately figure out how to master ourselves in these very difficult moments, our patient care will suffer, our relationships get weakened, and so what I'd like to explore with you today 
is how do we manage the fact that judgment, when we really care about the outcomes, is completely normal? The other thing that's really normal, though, is curiosity. And unfortunately, there's usually a force field between these two. We're generally curious about things that are fascinating, that we like and that we're interested in, and we're usually judgmental about things we're irritated about and completely find appalling. But the fact is, for us to manage conflict in high-stress, time-pressured, critical care conversations, we have to do some magical thing to bring judgment and curiosity together. Let's dig into this just a little bit more. So I'm a simulationista. I'm passionate about experiential learning. So I'm going to ask you to give me your um, I've unearned trust. <laughs> um, I know I haven't necessarily done much to build it up yet, but what I'd like to do is ask you to do three things in the course of this talk. And one is going to be to think of a clinical mistake you saw someone else make, and that we're going to workshop that through the rest of the talk. So it should be a medium-sized mistake that really annoyed you. Let's leave off for now something that led to real serious adverse patient harm. And why are we going to do this? We're going to do this because in order to manage a conflict like you saw between Victoria and my characters, we've got to have something to do. So I'm going to start introducing you to that something to do. And then as our time unfolds, I'll put in a few more moves. So the three things I'm going to ask you to do are think of that mistake, and then in a minute, if you're willing, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to ask you to say, what the fuck? And that is a moment of catharsis that I'd like you to enjoy about whatever that person did in that mistake. Because remember, judgment is normal. And then the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to do three sharp claps, which I can only do in a wimpy way because I have my uh, clicker here, but I'd like to ask you to do it really well. One, two, three. And the reason for the three sharp claps is what we've learned from brain science is if we want to start separating and moving on from one emotional state, we need a dividing line. We need something dramatic. So are you guys ready? Do as I do, please. Stand up. What the fuck? <laughs> Three sharp claps. Awesome. Thank you very much. We're going to use that again in a minute. So why do we need this? When Jenny, the presenter at the beginning of this talk, begins speaking, she thought she was doing a completely awesome job. Her intention was pure, her heart was pure, her goals were good. However, she's quite unaware of her impact. Oops, let's see. Her impact. <laughs> However, Vic, who's been kindly coaching me for months on this talk, is thinking to herself, because she cares so much about this conference, WTF, this is so boring, I have to do something. So I'm aware of my intention, Vic is aware of my impact, and this is what happens to us in critical care conversations or any meaningful conversation. When we are the uh, recipient of a bad impact, we interpret that as a sort of threat. And what we know about our neurology is when we feel threatened, the amygdala kicks in, Adrenaline starts flowing, and what we have is an amygdala-guided, adrenaline-fueled reaction to whatever the other person is doing. And it's terrifically difficult to get ourselves back on track from that rocket moment. It's important that we do so, however, because when we are certain in the very moment that we most need to be skeptical about our own thinking, in the very moment when we really need to know where that other person is coming from so we could really figure out whether the patient needs to go to CT or not, we are certain when we should not be. And the danger of certainty is beautifully captured in the work of Katherine Schultz, 
uh, writing about adventures at the margin of error. And so I just ask to take a moment and just read that to yourself, if you would. So I'm just going to highlight the last bit there. When we're caught up in our own convictions, so I think my character thinks I'm doing an awesome talk, Vic thinks I'm doing a crap talk, other people's stories, the reason why they might be doing what they're doing, which is to say other people, cease to exist. So what's missing? I'm going to argue that we have to master ourselves. We have to do this brain training of allowing ourselves to say, what the fuck? And then start something like the three sharp claps in the spirit of kettlebells for the brain that I think uh, Scott Weingart talked about last year. One of the simple, easy ways to do that is attunement, is paying attention. You guys are deeply trained to attune to signs and symptoms. So I'd like to give you a model of that between a mother and a baby. And I think this is incredibly uh, valuable, even though the people in the video are younger than most of us, because most of us humans respond amazingly to attention, and we can instantly figure out what's going on with the other person when we have the right level of attention. So let's take a look. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh. So, last year, I believe Liz Crow asked this question, what's love got to do with it? The end of that video is so very difficult to watch because the mom has withdrawn that precious attunement. And I don't know about you guys, but when I feel like a colleague is not listening to me, I certainly am acting a lot like that baby. And we expect each other to somehow solve problems without attuning to each other as that mother did. So last year, Liz talked about the protective and healing qualities of bringing love into the unit. But I'm gonna talk as a social scientist and management MBA, 
as the, about the efficiency and effectiveness of infusing positive regard into our interactions. Because you saw that that mom instantaneously made a connection and was developing that baby's power of expression and extension without a single explicit learning move, just through her fine attention. So, okay, bringing love to the ICU or the emergency department, I'm going to leave that project to others. I'm going to ask you, though, to bring its cerebral cousin, curiosity, into your work. And in a minute, I'm going to ask us to use that stand up, what the, and clap exercise and extend some more moves into it. Why? Why is it so important for us to practice getting curious? When we are curious, we can attend to the signs and symptoms that we are getting from our colleagues about what's going on with them. We can see what they're doing, but we don't know what they're thinking. And curiosity is the first step to attuning to that. And why we need to attune to it is their frame, their perspective, what they care about, what they were trying to accomplish is going to show each of us the way to meet them where they are and collaborate with them. So um, I'd like to give you a really simple takeaway from this talk that I learned last year from Susan Eller from uh, uh, Stanford, and we're going to practice this in a second. She said, Jenny, you know, whenever you're feeling like, what the fuck is that person doing, change it to WTF to WTF, what's their frame? So what I'm gonna ask you to practice in a minute is when you're thinking what the about your colleague, I'm gonna ask you to practice a couple moves to turn around and figure out, get yourself poised to find out what's going on with them. So in a moment, we're gonna stand up, practice doing what the three shark claps, the point of which is to start resetting yourself away from that judgmental mindset. We're gonna use the super neuro um, uh, nervous system reset of breathing. And then here's the cognitive behavioral bit. I'd like you to imagine that the mistake you originally thought of Imagine that your very best mate, your very best buddy, your most trusted colleague on the unit was the one who made the mistake. Because when a trusted other makes a mistake, we usually are super interested why, or at the very least, we want to be there for them. So if you're willing, we're going to do this together. All right. Do as I do, please. Stand up. What the? OK, deep breath. And now, imagine your very best trusted colleague is the one who made the mistake. You could allow a little Mona Lisa smile to come to your face. And that's your move. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to figuring out how to apply this. So when you go home to the emergency department or the ICU, it may not be possible for you to stand up and say, what the fuck, and three sharp claps, and all the rest. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do instead is rehearse this silently now. So this is what you can do when you go back. You see the mistake. You think to yourself, WTF. You travel back to this time and you remember when you heard 2,500 people doing three sharp claps as energized colleagues wanting to develop better practice. You hear that in your ear. You breathe. And then you imagine that that other person is a valued, respected other who probably had a good reason for doing what they're doing. And you're going to wonder what is their frame. So. Your prescription for future practice. I invite you to do one WTF to WTF once a day for a week. Then we have a beautiful community here. Share your stories 
Hashtag WTF to WTF, does smack. And if you'd like to tell me about it, I would love to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. You actually had me at the start too, and I was completely in on it. So thank you. Um, the, does Twitter have any feedback for Jenny? They do. Um, most people feel like they got rickrolled at the beginning of that. <laughs> if you don't know what rickrolled is, Google it. But tons of buy into the demonstration. Um, one question relates to scaling up your principal to institutions. Um, we work in institutions that, by their nature, often are cold and removed and certainly not loving or caring of the people they work in and extremely judgmental of the work that we do. What's the um, contagion? That is it just infusing this concept in people and will the institutions change or does that require a totally different approach? So um, I actually think a lot about that, uh, both for my own organization. Um, I seek to be a deliberately developmental leader who tries to walk my talk and make lots of mistakes and get feedback, but we're not all lucky enough to live in an organization like that. So in my view, what uh, organizational theory tells us about that is we each have to be our own little infective agent. And every single time you have a conversation that includes some curiosity and positive regard and infuses that into that little micro engine, it's more likely that other conversations like that will start. And I think starting in a small scale with your own practice and your own small group is the best way to get started.